Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Well, I'm here tonight uh, because I belong to a group. Uh, and this group asks its adherents to believe certain rather extraordinary claims. You know, for example, uh, this tradition asks me to believe in things, certain things that I myself have never seen, and in some cases asks me to believe in things that no human being has ever seen. Uh, this tradition also tells stories about the distant past that are clearly at odds with the way things work in the present day. And to the uninitiated, these stories can seem mysterious, suspicious, and even downright wrong. But despite all of this, my tradition has had a tremendous impact on politics, on education, and even on the daily life of virtually everyone in this room. And I'm, of course, talking about my experience as a scientist. <laughs> oh, I think maybe some of you thought I was going to talk about, say something else there. Uh, but it's true. Science at, certainly asked me to believe in things that I have never seen. Uh, you know, it asked me to believe in little tiny molecules uh, that are too small for me to see with the naked eye. It tells me stories about the distant past, like the fact that billions of years ago the universe was compressed into a volume that is more than one trillion times smaller than one of these molecules, and that at that time the universe obeyed physical laws that were quite different than the laws we know today. Now, it also gives me some rather strange truths, like the fact in quantum mechanics that it tells me that particles sometimes behave as particles and sometimes they behave as waves, and these truths seem at best mysterious uh, to the uninitiated, uh, and at worst they seem wrong. And yet, science has had a tremendous impact uh, on our lives, from space travel to the importance of STEM education to the curing of human diseases. Of course, I am also a Christian, and I could say many of the same things about Christianity. Christianity asks me to believe uh, in a God who I have never seen. Uh, it tells me stories uh, about the ancient past involving things like the parting of seas and people being raised from the dead. And to non-Christians, these stories seem mysterious and sometimes even downright fallacious. And yet, Christianity has had a tremendous impact on our society, uh, forming the basis of much of the American political system and also uh, being the source of founding of most of the private universities uh, across the United States. Now, I'm not implying uh, that these two sets of truth claims are equivalent or that they should even be evaluated in the same manner. What I'm trying to carry across here is that just between science and Christianity, just focusing on Christian faith for, for the time being, just between these two things, there are a dizzying array of truth claims here. And so, how do we decide what is true and what is false? And how can we be sure? How do we get to certainty? That's what I want us to talk about tonight. Now, but before I get to certainty, before I get to that, there's one uh, popular misconception that I want to dispel here at the beginning. Uh, and that is the, I, this is a misconception about how science and Christianity interact. And the myth is that being a Christian means you can't believe in, and I've left a blank there for you to fill in your favorite controversial scientific topic like evolution, the Big Bang, dinosaurs, whatever you like. The idea here seems to be that Christians are supposed to stand for some particular um, list of observable facts. You know, how old is the universe? Does the earth revolve around the sun or the sun around the earth? What is the origin of species? And the perception is that the difference between science and Christianity is just which account of those observable facts you believe is correct. You know, scientists contend the Earth is this many years old. Christians contend it's this many years old. Scientists believe that trilobites existed. Christians don't believe that trilobites existed. Scientists like Coke. Christians like Pepsi. <laughs> and so according to this myth, science and Christianity is an either or. Either you're on this side or you're on that side. Um, and Thus, according to this myth, you have to choose one or the other. If you want to be a Christian, you have to abandon all the scientific teaching you might pick up. If you want to be a scientist, you have to abandon everything about Christianity. And now, as I've said, this is a myth, uh, but it's one that's a significant point of pain. So I want to spend a little bit of time unpacking why I think this is a myth. You see, in Christianity, most of the arguments with science are based on biblical scriptures. And as a Christian, I do believe that the Bible is true, and it contains a great deal of evidence about how God has acted in the natural world. 
but I'm not really sure that you all understand the way that I use that information. And so I have an activity for us. Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys a series of questions. You guys are going to get to ask me questions later. I get to ask you questions now. <laughs> and all these questions are going to have to do with the first chapter of the book of Genesis. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Genesis starts out with the phrase, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on to recount how God creates the stars and the earth and the oceans and the plants and the animals and humans. And it divides all of this activity into six days. Uh, and then at the end of the, the passage, it says, and on the seventh day, God rested. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a few questions about this, this passage. And I'm going to ask you to answer in a very particular way. Because I don't, I don't want to know what you think about the first chapter of Genesis. We're not taking a popularity poll. I don't think we'd learn very much from that. What I want you to do is I want you to think. And I want you to pretend, get into the mindset where you pretend that you think that the first chapter of Genesis is true. You might actually think that. You might not think that. But for the next five minutes, just humor me and pretend that you think the first chapter of Genesis is true and answer the following questions. So first question, I'm going to make a statement. And you guys are going to give me by show of hands whether you think it's true or not. If Genesis 1 is true, then the heavens and the earth were created in six days. Hmm. If Genesis 1 is true, does this necessarily follow? OK, now by show of hands, how many people say, no, if Genesis 1 is true, that does not necessarily follow? OK, a smattering of folks. How many people say, yes, if Genesis 1 is true, that does necessarily follow? We've already got, we've got some dissension there. OK. All right, so I'm going to ask a slightly different question. Basically the same question, just a little bit different. One stellar day is 86,164.09 plus or minus 0.1 seconds. Now, I got that off of Wikipedia, so it must be true. <laughs> Thus, if Genesis 1 is true, the heavens and the earth were created in 516,984.54 plus or minus 0.03 seconds. And just lest you want to feel like you need to get your calculators out, that second number is the first number times 6. And I've propagated my errors, so the error is not 6 times as big. So if Genesis 1 is true, that's, how, that's, that's six days. That must be how long it took. And here, this to me as a chemist, this really gets to the crux of the question, which is significant digits. <laughs> because when the writer of Genesis wrote six days, did they mean 6.000000? How many zeros are on that measurement? So, so I wanted, now by show of hands, how many people, how many people think, no, it does not necessarily follow that it was 516,984 seconds. Okay, slightly more. How many people think, yes, it follows that it was 519,000? Okay, still a few folks who are like, yeah, that's what it means. Okay, so uh, what I want you to see from this, I intentionally made this a somewhat humorous exercise, but what I want you to see is that scripture, even in apparently simple scripture like Genesis 1, requires interpretation. You guys didn't agree. I told you all to pretend that you agreed that it was true and you didn't agree about these statements. Okay? Um, and the hermeneutic by which we interpret scripture is not set in stone. It's not in some confession of faith or some creed or some catechism. In fact, the way, we interpret, the way Christians interpret scripture is usually something that individual Christians wrestle with, wrestle with throughout their lives. But this actually goes both ways, because just as scripture and church teaching require interpretation, so too scientific evidence requires interpretation. Now I can tell by your silence that some of you don't believe me. Because after all, isn't science just facts like, well, there are 206 bones in the human body, or lithium reacts vigorously with air. Isn't that science? How is there interpretation to that? Well, the answer is that that is part of science, but science is not just facts like that. Uh, as Henri Poincaré said, science is, is made up of facts. Uh, just as houses are made of stones, so science is made of facts. But just as a pile of stones is not a house, so a collection of facts is not necessarily science. Because science is more than just a catalog of observations about the physical world. Science is the business of interpreting those observations and giving them shape and meaning. Now let me give you an example of how this works. Suppose you were a farmer. And you send one of your hired hands to get a bag of cornmeal that you have stored in the barn for the winter. And the hired hand returns to tell you that, unfortunately, that bag is now full of maggots. Isn't that a wonderful image, just a bag of maggots? OK, so this is a scientific observation. It's a fact. And I want you guys to interpret it for me. 
So how do you interpret this fact? Someone tells you maggots form in cornmeal. Okay, A, what is your explanation? A, this is a result of the miraculous intervention of a divine being. How many people are going for A? Okay, nobody's going for A. All right, B, this data has been falsified. The farmhand is lying to me. Maggots do not form in cornmeal. Got maybe one person there. All right, C, this is a natural phenomenon. Plausible, air and cornmeal spontaneously produce maggots. I've got the chemical equation, air plus cornmeal <laughs> equals maggots. People going for that one? No, okay. D, this is a natural phenomenon. Flies lay eggs in the cornmeal, which eventually become maggots. How many people have that Okay, so there you go. Now, I fully expected all of you to agree on that one. Uh, and that's wonderful. And the only problem is that for about 2,000 years, the dominant scientific interpretation of this fact was actually C. That air and cornmeal come together to spontaneously produce maggots. It was a theory known as spontaneous generation, the idea that under the right circumstances, non-living things could come together to produce living things. Now, at the same time that, that scientists were in, in favor of this spontaneous generation idea, Christian scholars looked at the Bible and saw passages like the Israelites finding quail in the desert, and they concluded, aha! Look at this, spontaneous generation in the Bible. The Bible supports the scientific conclusion. Everyone agreed, Christians and scientists. Unfortunately, they were all wrong. Because in the latter part of the 19th century, Louis Pasteur clearly showed that spontaneous generation is not the natural course of things. And the conclusion from this is not B. It's not that the data has been falsified. The original observation that maggots form in cornmeal was correct. Uh, and Christians do continue to believe that the Israelites found quail in the desert. It's just that that evidence had been misinterpreted. Life doesn't come out of non-living things as a matter of course. Whenever that happens, something unusual or even miraculous has occurred. Thus, we see that both science and faith require interpretation. And interpretation can sometimes be mistaken. But those mistakes don't mean that the entire field of thought is invalid. It just means that we have to correct our thinking. And while we can always, so while we can always find some interpretation of science that, in, that disagrees with some interpretation of Christianity, that doesn't actually say anything fundamental about the compatibility or incompatibility of the two fields. Con or to put it sort of in a shorter fashion, uh, conflicting interpretations do not necessarily imply conflict between the disciplines. And what we want to talk about tonight is whether beneath these various conflicts of interpretation between these superficial conflicts, is there any deeper relationship between science and faith? And if so, what does it look like? And to me, the fulcrum, the sort of pivot point uh, of all of this is the idea of certainty. You see, certainty is something that I would contend we all want. Because, you know, we, when we make predictions, we want to know with certainty that our prediction is right. You know, I don't think very many people set out to build a plane thinking that it might not crash or building a building that might not fall down. They want to build the plane that will certainly fly. Likewise, in matters of faith, very few people are interested in finding out that something good might happen to them after they die. They want to know with certainty that something good will happen. And contrary to popular belief, science by itself does not lead to certainty. This is another myth. Science doesn't lead to certainty, but of course, this is confusing because science does give us greater and greater confidence in propositions. But confidence is not the same as certainty. You see, only in pure mathematics is evidence alone enough to produce certainty. In the physical world, it rarely works out so neatly. You know, in most situations, there's evidence that supports a given conclusion and evidence that contradicts it. You know, as Richard Feynman once said in science, we have found it of paramount importance that in order to recognize, to, in order to progress, we must recognize ignorance and leave room for doubt. Scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty, most unsure, some nearly sure, but none absolutely certain. Because even for a theory with no known exceptions in science, we must always be wary, because it's always possible that the next experiment, the next measurement, will actually prove the model wrong. And classical mechanics will give way to quantum mechanics, or Newton's gravity will give way to Einstein's gravity. And so if certainty is something we want, but science doesn't give it to us, how do we arrive at certainty? How do we even know that we are certain of something? Well, for the purposes of this discussion, I want to propose a working definition of certainty. So suppose that we have a friend, Sally, uh, and Sally is out hiking. 
So this is a cartoon illustration of my idea of certainty. So she's been out hiking and she's hungry. She's been hiking all day. She's eaten all of her trail mix. She's got a couple of more hours before she gets home. She really wants some food. And luckily, she looks across the valley. And what does she see but a plate of bacon? <laughs> and now, while science is not either or, bacon is definitely either or. Either you like bacon or you are wrong. So there's Hungry Sally. She looks across the valley. She sees the bacon. She wants the bacon. But unfortunately, she cannot get across the valley to the bacon. It's too far to jump. And the sides of the valley walls are too steep to hike down. Ah, but she notices there's a bridge. And she has to decide if she is going to cross the bridge. And unfortunately, it's a pretty skeezy looking bridge. It's got some rope that's fraying. It sways whenever the, the wind blows. It looks like the, the, the posts that it's tied to are about to fall over. Will the bridge hold Sally if she attempts to cross the ravine, or will it collapse, leaving her to plunge to her death? <laughs> Sally may think the bridge is going to hold her, but how can she be certain? Well, the bridge, in this example, gives the ultimate definitive test of certainty. Because if Sally attempts to cross the bridge, it indicates that she is certain the bridge will hold her. Unless she is suicidal, she would have no motivation to step under a bridge she thought would not support her. Likewise, if Sally chooses not to cross the bridge, it indicates that she is not certain that the bridge will hold her. And ultimately, I think this is the key measure of certainty. Our certainty, or lack thereof, is ultimately tested by the decisions we make and the actions we take. Certainty is certainty to act. You know, in getting on the plane to come here, I expressed my certainty that that plane was not going to crash. Uh, in agreeing to marry my wife, I did that in part because I was certain that she loved me. Likewise, uh, I have yet to buy my daughter a pet because she is seven, and despite her protestations to the contrary, I am not certain that she would remember to feed it. <laughs> and so this is our working definition of certainty. Certainty is certainty to act. And now I want to, want to note that this definition of, of certainty allows certainty and doubt to coexist inside the same brain. You know, Sally could have any number of reasonable doubts about the bridge collapsing under her. You know, looking at the rope, she could be doubting. But if she crosses the bridge, even with those doubts, even carrying those doubts with her, we are going to define her as being certain that the bridge will hold. And this runs contrary to what we sometimes think of as the definition of certainty. We think of certainty as the absence of all doubt. And that would be a fine definition of certainty in mathematics, but in life, this definition is useless. Because whatever decisions we make in science and history and relationships, there's always room for doubt and questioning. We can never really cast it out entirely. And so defining certainty as the absence of doubt would mean defining certainty as something that doesn't exist. We might as well define certainty as rainbow unicorns dancing over a sea of talking dolphins. It's a fantasy. It doesn't really exist. And so certainty is certainty to act. And this is a kind of certainty that science by itself is ill-equipped to provide us. And see, the central problem with science in this realm is that science posits that truth is objective. That is to say that truth is an object that exists apart from its observation by the subject, namely me. Thus, science divorces the truth from the truth seeker. You know, to put it into context, you know, Jesus, in one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture, tells his disciple, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The promise of modern science, by contrast, is the somewhat more mundane, you shall know the truth, but the truth will probably not have any perceptible impact on the way that you choose to behave. Because truth is out there, and you are in here. And this is particularly true in chemistry. Chemistry cannot change me as a person. Actually, strike that. That's, that's not true. Chemistry can change me as a person, just not in ways that are legal outside the states of Colorado and Washington. <laughs> You see, all the ways that chemistry can change me as a person are forbidden by the rules of academic inquiry. Because we don't want the experiment to influence the observer. You know, there's a reason why we don't have you taste the fine white powders that you make in organic chemistry labs. They would change you. You'd be breaking bad. 
And so the real truth, the real result is that while chemistry can absolutely change your life, chemistry class, maybe not so much. And while this stance is very beneficial to the practice of science, because you know, I'm not sure how many chemists would continue to do experiments if they knew that every compound they made was going to be tested on them personally, still, I think this dichotomy further highlights why science by itself isn't enough. It possesses no power to change people. And this is the place where faith becomes useful in science turning it from just a mechanical exercise into something vibrant. Now, in order to see why we need faith to accomplish this transition, we first need to be clear on why, why science doesn't lead to certainty. Because we've seen that science can give us greater and greater confidence in a proposition, but it never actually gets us all the way across the gap from indecision to certainty. It might leave behind a big gap or a small gap, but there is always a gap that we have to get across. And that last step, the step across the gap, is the step of faith. Now, it need not be religious faith. You can have faith in a person, or faith in, idea, in an idea, or faith in the law of gravity. But in order to make that step from indecision to certainty, you have to put faith in something. Because faith is the thing that gives us certainty. To state it mathematically, Evidence by itself does not give certainty, but evidence in combination with faith, faith placed in the evidence, does lead to certainty. And I want to emphasize here that, again, that we are talking about certainty to act. We aren't saying that faith somehow dis disproves all of our doubts or removes all of our questions. Certainty and doubt can coexist. Faith is just the thing that convinces us to temporarily set aside our doubts and act in spite of them. And so it is clear that we need faith when we have to make decisions. Because on the way here, I had to decide if I was going to board the plane or not. On my wedding day, I had to decide if I was going to say I do or not. I couldn't say I may be. And when I get home, I'm going to have to decide whether or not I'm going to buy my daughter a dog. Because the decisions that we make force us to place our faith in something in order to make the decision. And so the question isn't, do you have faith or do you not have faith? Because everyone has faith. The question is, in what do you place your faith? Because it's clear that whatever we place our faith in is going to have great power over us. It's going to determine the things we are certain about, and thus, it will also control much of how we behave. And so we need to be very, very careful about the things we put our faith in. And so if we're evaluating different frameworks of faith, uh, I would say that there are really three different qualities uh, that a perfect framework would have. Uh, it should be comprehensive. That is, it should be relevant to every decision that you have to make. It should be accurate. That is to say, it should always lead you in the right direction uh, as far as those decisions go. And it should be effective. That is, it should always motivate you to act according to your principles. Now, there are any, many, many different frameworks we could evaluate in this way. And I encourage you to do this on self-reflection. Um, to, to name your framework of faith and then ask yourself, is it comprehensive, is it accurate, is it effective? For the next five to ten minutes or so, I'm going to discuss my own framework, uh, one that is Christian, and try to answer these questions about it. So the first question, is Christianity comprehensive? Well, on this point, I can honestly say uh, that I have examined a number of worldviews, both religious and not, and Christianity is, in my experience, uh, the most comprehensive framework of faith that I've encountered. And now this shocks many people because they think of God or Christianity as just filling in gaps that science can't fill. You know, in ancient times, people needed God to explain all sorts of things they couldn't understand, things like lightning and famine and droughts. But now we understand all of those things in terms of physics and chemistry and biology. And so as time goes on, we find ourselves needing God less and less and less, and eventually we won't need him at all. How could such a primitive framework be comprehensive. Well, the key fallacy that's at work here is the idea that God can only exist in phenomena that science cannot explain. That the expansion of scientific knowledge necessarily squeezes God into smaller and smaller boxes. The reality is that God is not a God of the gaps, but the God of everything. The truth is that as science gets bigger, God gets bigger, or at least our understanding of God gets bigger. 
you know, to return to our initial diagram of science and Christianity, it's not as if God only exists uh, in the, the bits of knowledge that are over here that are explicitly Christian. He also exists in the ones that are observations of science, and indeed he exists in all the gaps in between. And, and so we see that our observation of the natural world teaches us something about the God who created it. And at the same time, the, this Christian conception of God has a strong influence and a, and a comprehensive influence on the way that we behave because Christianity offers a model for my behavior in the person of Jesus. Now, this model, this standard, is one that I largely fail to meet, but it's a model nonetheless. And this combination of a worldview that accommodates evidence, that searches out the truth, and provides an actual concrete example of how I'm supposed to behave, that is a comprehensive framework of faith. It covers all the bases. So I would say that Christianity certainly is comprehensive. Second question is, is it accurate? Well, now this is a point uh, where Christianity takes a beating uh, in many popular, uh, much of popular opinion. After all, you know, what is Christianity but a set of unsubstantiated, fanciful claims about angels and miracles, things that don't actually hold up to cold skeptical analysis? How could something based on such a flimsy foundation ever be accurate? And this would be a serious problem, a serious flaw with Christianity if it were actually true. It's not, though. Uh, I mean, it is true that there is a place in the Christian worldview for extraordinary claims, but there's also a space in the Christian worldview for skepticism. Uh, and in particular, you know, if we look back here, there is a role for scientific skepticism uh, in the Christian worldview, and it's actually a very important one. Scientific skepticism helps us to correct errors in our thinking. Now, some of you may bristle at this idea, but think back to the, that spontaneous generation example. There, scientific observation helped everyone, scientists and Christians, to remove errors from their thinking. And this is one of the powerful things about the Christian faith, because we believe that God sits both outside and inside the physical world. And now that means that scientific study allows us to correct certain mistakes we might make in how we think about how God acts. So, you know, unlike something like Zen Buddhism, where the divine exists entirely apart from physical reality, in Christianity, science gives us some measure of confidence that what we, the things we are saying are actually correct. And science isn't alone in this. You know, there's historical criticism, archaeology, anthropology. All of these things help us to evaluate various Christian claims about reality. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and say that I have examined every single Christian claim from the point of view of science, archaeology, and anthropology, and I can vouch that every single one of them is true. I haven't done that, and I would have to be honest and say that there are even some claims of Christianity that I'm not so sure about, that I have some doubts about. But there is one form of testing uh, that I use that, I have, that has given me great confidence in the accuracy of Christianity, and that test is the test of action. Because the most important truths for me in Christianity, they are not ones that happened 2,000 years ago. The most important truths aren't questions of whether an angel really appeared to Mary or whether Jesus really walked on water. The most important claims in Christianity are ones that affect me, the way that I behave now, and those are things that I can test. You know, at one point Jesus tells his disciples, he says, blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. That's something you can test. If I really purify my heart, does it actually help me to see God better? At another point, one of Jesus' followers who was in prison says that we can rejoice in suffering because suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and hope does not put us to shame. Is that really true? Does suffering produce hope? That is something that I can test in my own life. And those are things that I have tested and I find them to be accurate. Even when I myself am false, even when I can't live up to the standard, I find that they ring true. And so there is uh, a very tangible and testable way in which Christianity has a reproducible accuracy. And so the final question, is Christianity effective? And for this final point, we, we recognize that any framework of faith you have, it needs to work. It needs to work for you. And what the Christian faith recognizes is that for us as humans to act in the face of incomplete information, it matters very much who is making the request. Now, this isn't true in science. If, I, if someone writes a scientific paper, it doesn't or shouldn't matter who wrote the paper. It should only matter what is in the paper. 
But in the case of action decisions, the source is always crucial. You know, if my wife texted me and told me to leave $100 in the mailbox, I would do it without asking a question. But if one of you texted me and asked me to do the same thing, I would react somewhat differently. Because it matters who is asking. And this is why impersonal ideals are generally insufficient as a framework of faith. They are simply not effective. For example, suppose my ideal is reason. The one thing I try to use to guide all my actions that I organize my life around, suppose that I am Mr. Spock. <laughs> I think many of you would say that this is noble, even maybe not such a bad idea. But the problem, but for, but the problem is that for reason to be effective, it has to give me more certainty than any person, my friends, my colleagues, my family, because from time to time, those people that I am close to are going to ask me to behave irrationally. And most of the time, I might be able to resist to let my abstract faith and reason guide me, even when it makes my children cry or annoys the heck out of my friends. But sometimes, maybe only rarely, but sometimes, I am just going to cave. I'm going to give in. I'm going to behave irrationally just because they asked me to. Because the source of the request matters. And if the request comes from the right person at the right time, I will abandon my impersonal ideal. And what Christianity realizes that it, is that in order for our faith to be universally effective, then there needs to be a person behind all of it. A person that motivates our study of the natural world, someone who enlightens our understanding of, of scripture, who guides our responsible conduct. And in Christianity, that person is Jesus. As Christians, we are convinced that when we place our faith in Christ, then the person of Jesus, who was raised from the dead, comes to live in us. And fundamentally, what I believe in is the power of that relationship to change me, to change who I am. That is what makes Christianity effective. So let me explain why that is. See, when I was in junior high and high school, I was a geek. Now, I know, I know, this is shocking to many of you. You're sitting there thinking, wait a minute, you're a quantum chemistry professor at MIT, and in high school you were a geek? Get out of town. <laughs> it's shocking, but it's true. In high school, I was uh, tall. I, 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 was, uh, t uh, I, was I was too smart for my own good. I was socially awkward. I was tall and skinny and unathletic, and I grew too quickly. So you can count on it that about six months out of the years, my clothes were going to be too small for me. And the unfortunate truth is that chicks don't dig tall, scrawny, awkward dudes who don't know how to dress themselves. <laughs> so in the social structure of my high school, there were the popular kids, and then there were kids like me. And I was one of those unpopular kids who desperately wanted to be cool. You know, I thought if I could just get into the in crowd, then I would be content. And it didn't make me a very good person. You know, it caused me to shun all the people I perceived to be lower on the social ladder than I was. You know, all the other people who didn't have the money to dress in the best clothes or all the other members of my chemistry Olympiad team who, to be fair, were far, far nerdier than I was. <laughs> and I have faced the same scenario time and again in my life. I want things. I want good grades. I want success in my career. I want wealth. I want fame. And I know that none of them are going to make me a very good person. I even suspect that none of them are going to make me a very happy person. But I want them just the same. Because the problem isn't with high school or the in crowd or with college or academia. The problem is me. The things that I want. The way that I am. And no matter how hard I work, this isn't a problem that I can solve because I am the problem. And I need a faith that is effective enough to solve that problem. And belief in a watchmaker God doesn't really help me here because if God just set the universe in motion and then hung out a sign saying be back in 25 billion years, then I'm stuck. Whatever I am is whatever I am. And most religions are even less help on this point because they tie acceptance by God to our ability to adhere to a set of rules or accomplish a set of tasks. Only in Christianity does God provide the means for us to change who we are. And the means is the person of Christ. And I find that that God, the God who changes me, is effective at motivating my decisions. So that's all I had to say tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to the Q&A time. Uh, before we get to that, though, I want to acknowledge that you know, there's one uh, elephant in the room, there's one question that I'm sure has been on all of your minds right now, 
And I, on purpose, did not address that question at all during this talk. So let me just get it out of the way before we get into the Q&A. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. There are some things that are mysterious that we're just never going to know the answers to. So we'll just move on to some easier questions. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, um, we have time now for question and answer period. Um, for this question and answer period, what I ask is that you come up to the mic, if you so choose, and um, keep your questions a question as opposed to a, a, a monologue. And if you would just keep them relatively brief and straightforward, that would be great. So um, seeing no questions here, I'll, I'll give you the question that I've got. Oh, I guess I should remind you on the text. If you want to text or email your questions, please feel free to do that. Again, the um, address is in your program. OK, so this is a little bit off on the side. So um, a number of po politicians clearly do not understand science. What does this say about our country's understanding of science? Wow, so that's true. So sci there is certainly a great deal of the confusion, both with you know, politicians and the, 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 the world at large in terms of science education. Um, you know, and I think that really does fall on us as scientists. I mean, our job as scientists is to educate and to carry across the things that we've discovered to society at large. And to, so and to some extent, we fail in that respect. Uh, I think the other thing, though, that we need to recognize that sometimes frustrates scientists is that they don't understand this, dis this distinction between confidence and certainty. They sometimes think that if they just present the, ob the evidence, then it will be obvious to anyone. Every you know, right-thinking person must agree with me, certainly. Uh, and it doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, certainty comes through other means uh, than just presenting of evidence. And so we have to learn as scientists also how to speak the language that politicians are going to listen to that helps them to feel comfortable uh, with the requests that we are making of them. Yes, please. Hi. <clears throat> Is this working? Yep. Yeah. Um, thanks for a very uh, thought-provoking talk. Um, I just wanted to address your thing about um, scientific truth being independent from the observer. Now, I know you have some background in quantum physics and things. Um, and we know that, um, and you'll know that, the sometimes observing a particle can change it. Um, I wondered what your thoughts on, on that were. Right. So this is so that's a great question. And I haven't actually gotten that question before, so I'll have to make up an answer now. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so what, he, what he's referring to is the idea that in quantum mechanics, there's, there's this idea of, you know, that, that that the observation of very, very small particles is, does not run independent of the process of observing them. So the idea is that by observing the system, I affect the outcome of what the system does. Even if I make the sort of most gentle, gentle measurement that I can, it will influence what happens to the system. I would say that that's still, con I mean, it, it definitely does get right up to the edge of the type of thing that science should be doing. But there still is a separation, I think, in most scientists' mind. Now, there's, there's a question philosophically about whether this is true or not, but most scientists who study uh, quantum mechanics would say that there's, there's this sort of interference between the observation or the apparatus that's doing the op op observation, but then they still think of the scientist as you know, some number of layers out here where that process doesn't necessarily affect the person who's looking through the microscope, who's, you know, that's looking at the electrons, that's looking at the particle. So there is still enough of a separation between the person who's doing the observation and the observation itself. But I agree, there is some philosophical question about whether this, this idea of the objectivity of the observer is really realizable on this sort of quantum mechanical level. Yeah. OK, from our text we have, um, how do you address the claim that quantum mechanics disproves the existence of God? Wow. Um, I would say that, that I, would, I would need to see some details of that proof. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it's, it's really not, um, you know, I think there have been, over the centuries, there have been many, you know, attempts at proving the existence of God, either through the use of reason or science or uh, any number of things. You know, in my, my interpretation of science is it is impotent, it is, it is unable to prove or disprove the existence of God. Uh, so that anything that, that purports to say, okay, we just take scientific evidence, we run through it, and we get to God exists. There's always some philosophical premise that's being in, in, injected there that, that, that gets you to that conclusion. Uh, so, I mean, I'd need to see some details to be able to try to figure out where that, that philosophical premise comes in. But, yeah. Okay. Please. 
Okay. <clears throat> in Genesis, I teach AP Biology, and you study electron transfer dynamics and solar energy, which is awesome. Uh, in Genesis, chapter 1, plants appear on the third day, and the sun appears on the fourth day. And it's my understanding that plants evolved underneath the sun. So I'm not sure, in light of your background, how would you address those two days? Right. So this, again, gets back to the, the point I was at the beginning about interpretation. In other words, you know, there are, there are, in fact, many different Christian interpretations of those first few chapters of Genesis. Um, and so it's not as if I can stand up here and represent, represent even all of Christianity and say, well, this is what Christianity thinks, because there's a very heterogeneous set of views on that. Um, and I think the thing that, the reason I didn't, you know, make it, you know, I could have gone through and said, well, this is how I interpret it. Because there's such a heterogeneity of things, I don't necessarily think that it advances the arguments or the, the, the discussion so much if I say, well, you know, this is my point of view and this is my point of view, because then we can get stuck in the, well, what about this? What about this? Which, you know, are the sort of the vagaries and the gray areas of interpretation. Um, you know, it's true that, that there are some, que some questions there about the order of the operations that are stated in Genesis um, as compared to what the scientific evidence seems to point to is, you know, that, you know, the first, first plants were photosynthetic and therefore would need sunlight in order to, in order to, to have lived. Um, no, there are, there, are, there are various ways that one can sort of try to say, well, how, do those things, how are those things reconciled with each other? Um, I prefer not to, you know, make, make any sort of dogmatic statement of, you know, this is the right way to do it. If you, if you really, really want me to, I will, but... Um. <laughs> it's up to you. Thank you. So okay. maybe I'll, uh, one of our questions is sort of a little bit more in depth on that, yes. that particular question. Uh, it asks, how does your understanding of chemistry guide your interpretation of the creation account in Genesis? Mm. Well, this is, that, so I mean, I guess I'll broaden that a little bit and just say science. Okay. Um, because, you know, because that, that's one of the things about chemistry. So another reason, I guess, for the, for the gentleman who asked the previous question, you know, he probably knows more about biology than I do. Um, because he's a biology teacher and I'm a physical chemist. So the last biology class I took, I was 17. So that was a long time ago. Um, so, uh, so I'll broaden it out and say, you know, one of the things that's, that's unique about chemistry is that, you know, we sort of sit in that sort of philosophical middle ground scientifically. We don't do cosmology, where we have to worry about the origins of the universe, and we don't do evolutionary biology, where we have to worry about things like evolution. It's like this middle ground, it's like, well, we're really very much about today and what molecules do today and so forth. So I don't actually, you know, my scientific, you know, my scientific study doesn't actually, it doesn't actually sort of uh, interact very much with those, those, you know, two big questions. You know, I think in terms of um, how my understanding of science um, informs uh, my understanding of the sort of first, first chapter of Genesis. I mean, one of the things that you can say about science is that it really does help you to understand. I mean, the first chapter of Genesis is so short. I mean, it gives you so little detail. And then you start to say, well, you know, so the, the level of scientific detail is just so much, so much grander and so much broader. And it helps you understand that, you know, this process of creation, in whatever sense you read Genesis, it's really been boiled down to something that's highly poeticized because it's, you know, a lot of the detail has been left out there of how God actually did it. You know, I mean, there's, there's that famous T-shirt that says, you know, you know, and God said, and then it lists out Maxwell's equations. You know, instead of <laughs> let there be light, it's got Maxwell's equations. And I think that's a really great tongue-in-cheek joke about, you know, okay, well, you know, this is actually the complexity of what God said. He didn't just say, let there be light. He said, you know, the integral of B squared minus, you know. And, um, so I, I think that's great because it does help us to say, okay, well, you know, when he said let there be light, there was a lot more going on than just the sort of poetic language of, you know, him speaking those words. Um, at the same time, I think there is a, a danger that we have uh, I've definitely met, run into people who were like, who, I've, who have said something to the effect of, you know, well, if the first chapter of Genesis had had Maxwell's equations in it, then I would believe it. Because then, you know, it would be like, well, how could they have come up with Maxwell's equations, you know, 5,000 years ago? It'd be way too complicated. And this, again, I think is a misreading of what the first chapter of Genesis is about. The first chapter of Genesis is not a magic trick. Okay, it's not like God hid some secret there that we're going to discover 5,000 years later is going to make us go, oh, so God really does exist. Um, that's not, not his purpose there. He's not sort of a, a hide-and-seek God who's like, you know, hiding little Easter eggs in the Bible for us to discover. Um, and so I think what we really want to, under, to, to read, what I like to read in Genesis, is really the, the sort of synthesis of scientific accounts and the things that we have learned there um, with the sort of purpose-driven information that God that provided by the first chapter of Genesis. I'm going to have you put your dad hat on. 
I'm yeah. supposed, to put my, I'm supposed to put my dad hat on? Yeah, you okay. might put your dad okay. hat on. I'm the father of six-year-old boys. I know I look like a grandpa. <laughs> How do you explain things to six-year-olds or last year, things like the dinosaurs and, and the timeline and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, the... You know, I, I, I think there's the, the question there. I mean, I, I suppose there, there are different, there's different bits of peril there, which are, you know, it also depends on your interpretation of scripture, how difficult this is. Because there are certain, cer certainly interpretations of scripture that say, oh, dinosaurs existed, most of what science is right, and that Genesis is a poetic account, all the way to, okay, Genesis is literally correct, and all the scientific evidence is really just sort of completely misunderstood. And I think the challenge is there, um, you know, along that spectrum, you know, very widely. Um, the one thing that I definitely try to do with my kids is I definitely try to let them think things through. Um, you know, I don't try to indoctrinate them or tell them one thing. I try to tell them, well, you know, some people think this thing, some people think this thing. Um, and this is partly, um, partly due to some of my own experience that, 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 some, that one member of my family, actually, uh, when he was growing up, had a very narrow and sheltered experience. And then he went off to college and discovered that many people had a diverse set of viewpoints. And all of a sudden, his sort of narrow, sheltered viewpoint seemed less plausible to him because he hadn't been exposed to any of those things. And so it just gradually crumbled and crumbled and crumbled until eventually it, it was gone. Uh, and I certainly don't want any of my kids to have a viewpoint that's fragile and sheltered that doesn't hold up to being exposed to a wide uh, array of viewpoints. Okay, so on another related question then, uh, were you brought up as a Christian or did you become a Christian later in life? And when, how did you decide to connect your faith to science? So the answers, uh, uh, did I, was I brought up as a Christian and did I come to Christianity later in life are yes and yes. <laughs> uh, because I was brought up as a Christian um, and then when I was in college, I decided that Christianity didn't have very much that was valuable for me and so I quit. Uh, and it wasn't until later in life that I decided to come back. Uh, and uh, I decided to come back to Christianity when I was a graduate student, a barren wasteland of graduate study. Um, and so then I actually had, I think, a fairly significant question, which was, you know, okay, well, I had this view now that God was interested in my life and he had purposes for me and this kind of stuff. And I had made this decision to go to graduate school without consulting him. So I could have, I thought, well, gee, I might be in big trouble here. <laughs> And so I really had to consider, well, is this what God wants me to do? And if so, why does he want me to do it? What does he have for me to do here? Because certainly, you know, I, 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 I have to confess that, you know, I, I think I'm probably not the only Christian who has this, but, you know, in my head, I have a hierarchy of jobs, you know, of jobs, you know, that are more, some are more Christian than others. You know, like there's like missionary is like way up here, and then like there's pastor, and then maybe like doctors and nurses are up here, and then like lawyers are down here. <laughs> You know, and scientists are maybe, you know, they're somewhere, they're definitely in the bottom half. Like, we're pretty useless. I mean, if I was like a scientist who was like a doc, like medical scientist, then maybe that'd be more close to doctor, that'd be good, but I'm not, I'm down here at the bottom. So I had to ask, you know, God, is there something useful that I can do um, as a scientist, or should I quit um, and do something that seems more Christian-y to me? Uh, and the answer that I got from God was, well, if you need to quit, I'll tell you. Uh, and he hasn't told me to quit yet, so. Professor, if we believe in an infinite, all-powerful God, then why would it be difficult to believe that God could create everything in six days instead of, for example, six nanoseconds if he is infinite and all-capable? Right. So this is a really good question. And that's one of the reasons that I shy away from giving one particular interpretation of Genesis, because God could do anything. Um, anything you know, he could have created the universe in 6,000 years ago. He could have created it 6,000 seconds ago along with our memory of all having come here and started, you know, listening to this talk. <laughs> you know, he can do whatever he wants. He is all-powerful. Uh, I think the only challenge that comes to me in terms of trying to, you know, take that view and say, okay, you know, all the scientific evidence that's there is just, you know, smoke and mirrors, is I have to think about the broader story of Scripture. And I say, well, if, if there's all of this apparent scientific evidence that seems to point to the universe being older than that, then what does that say about God? You know, that, that he would create a universe that has the appearance of age, but is in fact not actually old. You know, it has stars that are more than 6,000 light years away whose light is now arriving at Earth. So that means that it must have been in transit from the star to the Earth, you know, halfway in between when the universe was created. 
that certainly seems like a really big put-up job, right? that God's doing this to try to trick us. And that doesn't seem consistent with the story of who God is in Scripture. So, if you want it, so for me, that's the fundamental challenge with this sort of literal 6,000 years view of things, which is that it calls, calls into question the character of God for me, what kind of character God has. Thank you. Okay, you said while uh, you were analyzing what you place your faith in, that there is a need for a person for it to be effective, and that person is Jesus. So why does that person need to be Jesus? Why can't that person be humanity itself? And then um, why, why do we need the promise of an eternal afterlife and a God who gives us unconditional love to have faith as you defined it? Okay, so two questions yeah. there, um, which I'll try to split up. One is why does the person need to be Jesus? Why couldn't it be humanity? And the other one is why do we need an afterlife? So I'll try to answer both of those. Um, if I wander off topic, try to pull me back. Okay. So, as to why the person needs to be Jesus, it doesn't necessarily need to be Jesus. I tr I, if I said that anywhere in the talk, I'm sorry. I didn't, didn't mean to carry that across. I was reflecting for myself how Jesus plays that role in Christianity. But it doesn't need to be Jesus. You could have faith in any other person. I think that faith in humanity, again, draws closer to that abstract uh, ideal. You know, having faith in humanity is sometimes seems easy, uh, but then individual humans come along and that tests our faith in humanity as a whole. Um, I think that you know, we have much, a much greater capability as humans to listen to and place certainty in things that are told to us by individual people. You know, people that we idolize or people that we respect or people that we have great experience for or that we trust or love or have big crushes on. Um, we trust those people. We, we, they, they influence the things we're certain about. And, I mean, you, you may think that that's good, you may think that's bad, but it's a, just a fact of human nature as far as I can see it. And so that is why I was saying that, that ultimately one of the most power, powerful arbitrators arbitrator of certainty is who those people are in your life. Now, it could be that you choose a different group of people, but then you need to be really careful to analyze who you're trusting uh, and make sure that that person really is ultimately trustworthy. And, you know, in my experience, uh, people often let me down. Uh, they're not as trustworthy as I would like them to be. Maybe it's, uh, you know, my own personal experience. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the message that we have about Jesus is that he is one, the one person who will not let us down, uh, the person who will not fail, and that it is safe to place your trust in him. Now, the second question was about uh, the afterlife and why do we need this promise of an afterlife and an all-loving God in order to have faith, right? Uh, so this is actually a, a common something that, that actually worries me because, you know, when I was uh, six, one of my, my, I had one of my first, I was six, so I was a little kid, I had my very first existential crisis because I was watching the, uh, Nova on the Discovery Channel. I saw that in about six billion years, uh, the sun was estimated to go supernova uh, and it was going to consume all the planets in our galaxy, including the Earth, and everything was just going to be incinerated. Uh, and so when I was five, I realized at that point that finally that meant that I was going to die. Uh, you know, I, I could survive for up to six billion more years, but after that, it was, it was over. And I was crying on the couch. It was terrible. I was a very morbid child. Uh, I was very afraid of death. And so I have analyzed Christianity. So am I only believing in Christianity as sort of some wish fulfillment? Like, I'm, a, I'm scared of dying, and therefore this is an escape. Now I won't, I won't have to worry about it. And ultimately, that's, I've examined my faith, and ultimately that's not the motivation for me. I'm not motivated to believe in God because of the promise of eternal life. Because the promise of eternal life really is one of those very hard to believe claims. It's almost too good to be true. The reason that I believe in eternal life is because God is loving. And because of the experience I have of him and, I, and because I believe that he would not leave these kinds of these promises and this care for us and then just say, and then in the end, nothing. Uh, and so, to say that, you know, well, we believe in God because we have this great promise puts it backwards. Uh, we believe the great promise because we've experienced God. Uh, that is, that's the sort of proper order uh, of Christianity for myself and I think for many other Christians, uh, which is that, you know, it's our experience of God in here and now through scripture and through uh, relationships that drives us towards God. And then we grow to accept that, yes, he does have something good in store for us. Do you think that there is a difference between the faith involved in science and the faith involved in God? Do I think that there is a difference between the faith involved? Well, okay, so you mean the faith that, so, okay, so I'm 
Can you rephrase and clarify a little bit? Yeah, so like, as I understand your argument, the faith involved in science would be the same as me having faith that there is still a sidewalk for me to walk on when I go back to Friley, whereas I right, could okay. have the faith okay. that there is an elephant outside of this building okay. right now. Yeah, so, um, so the, yeah, so I, now I understand, so thank you for clarifying. So, um, so I should clarify that I don't think that there is any particular faith that is inherent to science. I think you can do science with no faith whatsoever. You can do the science and find the results, and so science sort of exists apart from it. I think that we as humans naturally add some component of faith to science. So, so, but I, so thanks for clarifying, because now I understand what you're saying. You know, it's like, it's like the, you know, the faith that I have of something scientific, like that if I step off the stage, that I will not just float in midair, but that I will fall to the floor. There's, there is an element of faith in that. Um, and I think really the question there is really just one of degrees. Because, you know, I talked about how science gives you confidence in something. You can have more and more and more and more and more evidence, but it never gets you all the way across the gap. You know, there are some things, like the law of gravity, that I have a whole, 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 whole lot of evidence for. And so there's, if there's a gap there, it's a tiny, 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 <laughs> tiny, tiny gap. And so it's not really that hard to just make that step and say, okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna fall if I step off the stage. But it's really a question of degree, because you, know, you take something else that we have less science, slightly less scientific evidence for, and it's a slightly bigger jump to say, okay, I'm certain that that's gonna happen. You say, okay, we have slightly less scientific evidence, it's gonna be a bigger jump. Slightly less scientific evidence is gonna be a bigger jump. So I think it's not a question of type as much as a question of degree. Does that make sense? Yeah, but then for science though, when we have uncertainty, at the same time, we are basing it off of evidence that is inherent with science, that it is observable, that there is a solid foundation within that uncertainty. So would that also qualify as a difference? Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, I wouldn't say so, um, in part because, um, I mean, I guess there's a, there's a question of, you know, is there, is there a hierarchy of types of evidence uh, which is one, one question that we could ask. Another one is that is Christianity entirely based on a different kind of evidence than science? And I would say that it's not entirely based on a different kind of evidence than science. I mean, there are elements of science, scientific evidence that I would say point at least towards theism, uh, towards the fact that there, was, there is or was some kind of God uh, who created the universe as it is. I mean, one of the most simple points of that is just simply the fact that there is something rather than nothing. Uh, suggest that there was something that made this happen. Um, now, that just, just gets you part of the way towards Christianity. It says, okay, well, there's some kind of God. It doesn't say that this was a God who raised Jesus from the dead, for example. There are other bits of evidence you have to bring in uh, to try to support that kind of a conclusion. Um, I think one of the important points is that, you know, in biblical times, there wasn't the distinction that we now make between the different disciplines, between this kind of evidence and that kind of evidence. It was just like anything that's convincing is evidence. Um, and so we could now go back and try to dissect, okay, how much of this is scientific and how much is historical and how much is legal and how much of it is eyewitness and personal. Um, but certainly Christianity uses more kinds of evidence than just science to prove its, or not to, to justify its claims. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, you explained that we cannot prove or disprove God's existence. Also that certainty and doubt can exist in the same mind. So how is Christianity different from agnosticism? Mm, okay, so, ag so agnosticism uh, is the idea that because we can't prove that God exists, I'll just stand in the middle. I'll say that I'm not sure. Um, and I would say that agnosticism, if I was to pick a philosophical viewpoint, agnosticism is the viewpoint that is, um, sounds like it would work the best with science. Because science, if you just wanted to be the pure science brain that says, I'm only going to think about science, I'm only going to trust science, and agnosticism would say, well, you know, if you can't prove it with science, then you just have to remain undecided. Uh, but there's a problem with this, which is that, you know, fundamentally, agnosticism is kind of an illusion. Because if I say, because with our definition of certainty here, again, certainty is certainty to act. If I say, well, you know, I'm not really sure if Jesus is the Son of God, but I, I don't go to church, uh, I've never been confirmed, I don't pray, I you know, don't love my neighbor as myself, uh, you know, any number of other things. If I don't do any of those things, then I would pretend that I actually am sure. I am sure that Jesus is not the Son of God, because if he was the Son of God, then I would do some of those things. Uh, and so the idea that I could be sort of agnostic and just sort of sit on the sidelines and not make up my mind is an illusion. 
because I live my life, and the way that I live my life tells me whether I believe or not. You know, because most of the major faiths have fairly clear guidelines about what you should be doing if you believe the things that they say. Um. Okay, please. Hi there, my name's Ian, um, and this question actually pertains to what you were just talking about. Okay. Um, there's a part of a chapter in Matthew 7 where it reads, um, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Can you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, so this is one of the scariest passages of Scripture because it says that there are going to be some people who go to Jesus and say, Jesus, Jesus, I love you, great. And he's going to be like, no, fine. Um, which is just, you know, terrifying because I'm like, oh, that's, that's just really disappointing. I'm sure you know, like, you get there, you're like, oh, that's such a letdown. Um, so, but what he's saying is that he, what he's drawing the distinction between here is those who, I mean, is just the idea that you could be Christian by mouth and not Christian by action. You could say, yes, I believe this. You know, and this is, again, this, the thing that the, gospel, that, that the letter, letter of James expounds upon is the idea that grace without works is dead. And if you keep saying, oh, yeah, Jesus, I believe Jesus, I follow Jesus, I think it's true, but you don't do anything, uh, you don't do the will of, your, of the Father in heaven, then by your actions you're saying, actually, no, you don't. You, you don't really believe. No. Sure. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay, another real easy one for you to answer. Okay, <laughs> how should Christian scientists approach research done for the greater good, like embryonic stem cell research, when you can probably find the cure for cancer, but there are conflicting morals from being a Christian? Mm, that, that is actually an excellent question. Uh, and if I'd had more time, I would have talked about some of these things. Because you know, this is, I think, one of the things that Christianity brings to science. Um, that, I mean, again, it's going to be, th th these are very difficult moral and theological questions. And so it's not as if I could say, oh, well, this is the answer to that. But I think that Christianity being brought to the table on that is extremely important. Uh, on something like stem cell research, on something like climate change, on something like, you know, any host of, of ethically relevant and responsible conduct of research questions, you need to have some moral framework with which to, you can, some common moral framework with which you can discuss this. And the unfortunate truth is that most scientists do not have that common moral framework. Uh, it's kind of the wild, wild west of morality in science. Um, and, you know, and that's all the more, more, more frightening when you know, know scientists as well as I do, and they tend to be pretty arrogant, self-centered, uh, and egotistical. And so to say that these are the people who are then going to make the decisions about whether this is ethical or not is really quite frightening. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that having people who understand the science, first of all, because it's not like I want people who don't understand the science but understand the, only the ethics to be coming in and saying, oh, well, here's what you should do. But having people who both understand the science and understand the ethical and theological implications of what we're doing is crucial. Um, because, you know, the, the unfortunate truth is that right now most scientists uh, enjoy uh, the fact that there are not repercussions for what they do. Um, so we, we enjoy this really unusual social contract uh, with society, which is you can think about all the great things science has done, right? So like drugs that cure diseases and, you know, the space, you know, the space rockets going to the moon and all of these wonderful things, you know, the double helix of DNA, and we even celebrate the scientists who discover these things. But then you can also think about all the debacles that science has gone through, you know, like making the atomic bomb, thalidomide, poisons, insecticides. Science did all of those things too, but we don't talk about the scientists who did those things. They're not, they certainly were never punished uh, for screwing those things up. And so there's no, there's a very uneven balance in terms of the ethical conduct of science, which is there's all the rewards and none of the consequences. And so if you're a scientist and you think, I want to work on something like stem cell research, there's every single reward in the world to just push the boundaries and push the boundaries because if it works, you will be celebrated. And if it fails, no one's going to hear about it. Um, and so I think there are some really, really important ethical questions that need to be where, where faith and science need to come together. And unfortunately, these sort of debates about how well, science and faith are at odds keep us apart. And they keep us from being able to have those kinds of discussions. Thank you for your talk. I do not have any disconnect between my faith in God and science. 
I believe the best explanation is that God created all things and that he gives us science as a creative method for discovering his creation. And that everything that we discover that is correct would fall under the, in line with the authority of how God created it. And also in the Bible, like in Romans 12, 2, it says, test things to know God's good and perfect will, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Um, so I believe that, you know, the scientific method ba basis is you observe something and you want to find out the result or the response. So you want to find out the truth. And the beauty of God's creation is everything is one-to-one -one and repeatable and all those things. So I just feel like with my faith, science is an expression of my faith in discovering God and learning new things about him and his heart. Um, that's wonderful. I mean, thank you for sharing that. I think that that's actually the kind of viewpoint that many of the earliest uh, practitioners of the scientific method, who many of whom were Christians, explicitly Christian, uh, took. They went, in, they went into this, this, this discipline of doing scientific experimentation in the hopes that it would perfect their faith, that it would be a way of testing and for them to understand God better. And so I'm glad that for you that's carried through. Thank you. Okay, how would you address the claim that God is too big to be explained by any one religion? Hmm, yes. Uh, so the idea that God is too big to be explained by any one religion. Um, that's a great bumper sticker. Um, great. <laughs> um, so I think there's a very seductive idea that, that some, well, that, that is that, you know, okay, well, there's some bit of truth here, there's some bit of truth here, there's some bit of truth here, um, but that there's this huge God that's so, so much bigger uh, than any of these religions can conceive of, um, and that, that, you know, he's so big that, you know, every religion has a piece, we should all just get along. Uh, and there are really sort of two problems with this. Um, the first one uh, is the problem of, okay, well, if that God is so big, you know, he's bigger than, a billion Christians have been able to conceive of, and a billion Muslims, and 700 million Buddhists, all of them together have not been able to think big enough to conceive of that God. What makes me think that I'm going to be able to think big enough to conceive of that God? Just little old me. Uh, the, philosophical argument, the philosophical analogy that people use here is the idea of an elephant. You know, that the analogy seems to be that, okay, well, there's an elephant, and that, you know, we've got these blind people in a room feeling the elephant, and some people feel the ear, and some people feel the trunk, and some people feel the tail. You know, the Christians feel the ear, and the Muslims feel the trunk, and the Buddhists feel the tail. You know, we each have a little piece of the elephant, and we have different interpretations of what the elephant is like based on, well, the, ele the elephant is really just a big ear, or he's a long tube, or, you know, he's kind of fluffy and fl floats around. <laughs> um, and so then, but, but in reality, God is bigger than all of that, okay? But the problem is that knowing that that is the case uh, requires someone who can see the whole elephant. Uh, otherwise, how do we know that we're all not just touching completely distinct things? You know, there's not a trunk lying over here and an ear there and a tail there, and there's really no elephant. Uh, so philosophically, the, the argument that someone, someone can just know that, yes, Christianity has some truth, Buddhism has some truth, you know, Islam has some truth, is really sort of a, a comforting viewpoint, but is pretty tough to swallow that one person would actually have that much knowledge. The second problem, though, is that different religions have very conf have explicitly conflicting claims about God. Uh, and the most important one for the purpose of Christianity uh, is really the concept of the purpose of Jesus. Um, and I think this gets misconstrued. You know, Jesus, you know, people take things of saying, you know, well, Christianity claims to have all the truth or know everything about God. You know, I don't think that's really the issue. The issue is really, what do we make of Jesus? You know, he died on the cross. He didn't seem like that bad of a guy, but he was killed. And what does that mean? What does his death mean? Was he ultimately a misguided martyr, or did it have some higher purpose? Because if it had some higher purpose, as Christians claim he died for the sins of humanity, he couldn't just be a normal dude and die for the sins of all of humanity. There had to be something special about him. And that question, the question of whether there was something special about Jesus that made him capable of dying for all the sins of humanity, or whether there was not, is an either or question. If it's true that he had something special about him, then then Christianity is the one religion that says that that is the case, and then we have to go further and explore that. If it was not, then Christianity is just not right. 
Um, and so it's not as if I can say, well, I'll accept Christianity somewhat and Buddhism somewhat because at some point you have that either or decision of either he did or he didn't. Um, and so that's uh, one of the other reasons I think that at the end of the day you do have to sort of choose one religion out of them. So, please. I wonder if you've experienced any disdain or disparagement at MIT. Have I experienced discouragement? Yes, absolutely. No, disparagement. Oh, disparagement. Oh, because okay. of your faith. Um, not much. Um, I, I, I can share, so I, in, in the end, I'll say that you know, ultimately I have felt fairly well, you know, not, not celebrated per se, but certainly tolerated. Um, but it is clear that to some extent, I think some, some folks don't know what to make of me. Um, so I, I was in a conversation uh, with one of the faculty members at MIT um, around the time that George Bush was elected for the second time. Uh, and he's a very, he was a very strong Democrat, and he was sitting here completely flabbergasted that anyone could possibly have elected George Bush again after how bad he had been during his first term, according to this particular faculty member. He was saying that talk, it was, I was there with him, and then there was one of the faculty members who was talking to this person, he was like, how could anyone do this? How could anyone think this? And then he turns to me, he says, Troy, you're probably the only one who can understand why someone would vote for Bush. <laughs> and I was like, why would he think that? And then I thought, oh wait, it's because I'm a Christian. He thinks because I'm a Christian, I must have voted for George Bush. Um, that was like his whole con conception of Christian means Republican. Um, and so I think to some extent folks don't know what to make of me, but I don't think, that he, in I don't think he intended that as, as a disparaging comment. Um, Okay, uh, how did you, I'm gonna combine a couple questions here, so. Uh, how did you personally come to believe um, in something that you couldn't see religiously? So in other words, what are the pieces of evidence that led you to your certainty and your confidence uh, moving forward? Um, in, in Christ. In Christ, okay. Um, so this is where, you know, I, you know, ultimately the things that give an individual person confidence and certainty are subjective. Uh, so the things that work for one person don't necessarily work for another. Uh, so I will share uh, the thing that subjectively uh, made me confident uh, with the knowledge that uh, it will probably not work for any of you, uh, and it, I may lose some respect in your eyes um, when I share this, but um, the thing that ultimately made me uh, confident that God exist is, exists is that when I was in graduate school, I feel quite certain that God spoke to me. Um, and now I was raised as a Presbyterian, uh, and as a rule, God doesn't speak to Presbyterians very often. <laughs> and so this was an unusual occurrence for me uh, to actually hear, you know, to hear some voice coming back. And it really was quite surprising for me, and it ultimately gave me confidence that there was a God out there, and that that God was not just a watchmaker, but a God who actually was interested in what I was doing. And it was actually quite frightening that he was interested in what I was doing. I would have preferred that he didn't pay much attention. Um, so that, for me, was the experience uh, that gave me confidence. Um, but I recognize that me saying that I heard from God is not going to make you say, oh, well, now I can believe. Uh, you know, it's subjective. Um, so. Okay. Please. I'm a science teacher and my students, when they learn that science doesn't produce absolute truth and that science can change in light of new evidence, they often jump to the opposite end of the spectrum and reject cer certain scientific claims or find science to be unreliable. Mm -hmm. What are the implications of this line of thinking and why is science still reliable even though it is not absolute? Yes. So I think the thing that, the thing that is wonderful about science um, and that's from the point of view of an educator. Really, thanks for, for sharing that, that point of view. I think the thing that is wonderful that we can always reinforce about science is there are a few things. So the first thing we can always reinforce is reproducibility. Um, that even if the scientific truth, the interpretation changes, I can always go back and redo the experiments. They will turn out the same. I might have to interpret, based on light of new evidence, they may, I may have a different interpretation, but they will turn out the same. In this sort of hands-on test, testability of science, I think, is one of the great things in terms of inspiring people to, to work on it, because it says it's a do-it-yourself model. I mean, you can't do do-it-yourself history. You need help to work on history. But do-it-yourself science works. Like, you can go into your garage and do science and learn new things. Um, the other thing that I always like to drive home is the sense of wonder, because if you have the sense of wonder of discovering something new, 
whether or not you learn that sometime later you might learn that that's actually only a part of the truth, or that there's a wider truth or a different explanation, you still have that sense of wonder at discovering it. And so if there's the combination of those two things, the idea is that you can do it yourself, so you can keep, keep, keep st testing, keep studying, and you'll learn new things, and that sort of quickening of your spirit that comes from wonder, I feel like that really draws you in and says, you know, okay, well, even if things shift, even if they change, you know, I can roll with those punches because the things that I have experienced, the things that I have shown, I still know are, are correct and they're not invalidated. Is that, no? Okay, unfortunately, we have to wrap up our time. I have only one more question that we have time for. Um, what are some resources or contemporary scholars that support or constructively debate the issues you've addressed tonight? Right, um, well, um, you know, I have to say that, that you know, I, I don't want to put too much of a plug in, but Ver, the, the Veritas organization does have a number of resources, not written by me, um, that really do go over things like the questions of science and faith, and they have popular questions like, you know, are human beings more than machines? And they'll have, you know, bite-sized dialogues and discussions and question and answer things about these things, and you can go to their website um, and look at the, some of those things. There's another organization uh, that's actually based out of the United Kingdom called um, A Test of Faith, uh, and they have a bunch of resources, uh, reading materials, small group guides, some DVDs uh, that also help walk you through some of these issues at the intersection of science and faith. Um, I also uh, have uh, a couple of books uh, whose titles I am going to botch, but I will try to get them right. Um, I, there is one that is, uh, um, there's one that's I, I believe called Science, God, and the Cosmos, um, which talks a lot about cre the creation of the universe and the role that God played in that and how that interacts with science that I found very useful. Uh, and there's another book that actually isn't about science, uh, but if you're interested by what I talked about tonight and wondering where did he come up with all these weird ideas about certainty, there's a book by uh, uh, an Episcopal theologian called Leslie Newbegin, which is called uh, Faith, Doubt, and Certainty, um, which lays out uh, in greater philosophical detail than I did tonight uh, some of these ideas about where certainty comes from. So, All right. Um, well, first, let's thank Troy for a wonderful time. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.